I think this is one of the hardest topics I've ever tried to think hard about. Making think, me cry, Catherine. I know. It's like, so sad. This is a pretty awkward question to ask. Is there such a thing mm-hmm. as overpopulation? Do people know that babies have the capacity to bring healing to anxious, troubled teenagers or grieving adult men? Catherine Pakalik, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm an admirer of yours, so thanks for making it out here. <laughs> Absolutely. And congrats on your new book. You've got Thank it. You. You've got it here in studio. Hannah's Thank Children, you. The Woman Quietly Defying the Birth mm-hmm. Dearth. That's right. And you yep. are um, single-handedly in part doing that. Um, <laughs> it's true. First, for folks who don't know, we'll get into your, your yeah. personal story here in a moment, mm-hmm. but tell me a little bit about your background. Yeah. Um, so I teach at Catholic University, the Catholic University of America, which is in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. And I was trained as an economist, so my formal training is in economics. Before that, I worked a little bit in public health. And um, let's see, I've been teaching at Catholic University for 10 years. Um, And then I'm a wife and a mom, and that's a big part of my life. So trying to combine those things together. And I've, I've worked a lot more and taught a lot more as my children have gotten older. And then to share a little bit, mm-hmm. you have how many kids? Mm-hmm. So um, I have, my husband and I together have eight children. And they range from 24 down to eight years old. And we also raised six children from his first marriage. He lost his first wife to breast cancer in 1998. And we got married a year later and we raised those six children. Amazing, amazing, beautiful family. I'm actually familiar with your husband's late Mm -hmm. wife's uh, Mm -hmm. story because she has, there's an incredible book about her life, The Appalling Mercy Mm -hmm. of the Strange, of, of, of God. Is that the title? Yeah, The Appalling Strangeness of the Mercy of God. I believe it's a, I believe it's a line from a Graham Greene novel. Mm -hmm. So I I don't think I can tell you which one, but maybe Brighton Rock, but um, that's where that uh, mouthful of a title comes from. And so your first, Mm -hmm. your your stepchildren, those six children are from Ruth's or Ruth's children who passed away due to cancer. Yes. And you, you actually dedicated Mm -hmm. um, Hannah's children to Ruth's children. Yes, exactly. And there's a bit of a story in that, Um, you know, I, well, this is the first book I've written in this, in this way. So, you know, I thought, well, but um, my middle name from birth was Ruth. Um, So a lot of people ask, well, you know, you use this middle name, Ruth, did you take that name? Um, because, you know, and I thought, no, that'd be a little bit mm-hmm. strange. No, no, this is, but I always loved my middle name. I, my first name is a Christian name. My, my, my second name is a, is a Jewish name. So I always loved it. Um, and so there was something um, unusual about it. So when we got married, that, that um, her name was in my name. And um, as an adoptive mom, you know, it's kind of a mystery that you share your maternity with the birth mother of your children. Um, and of course she's more than, you know, a mere birth mother. She raised them until she passed. Uh, how old were they when she passed and you became the adoptive Um, mom? So they ranged from, you know, about five or six, um, up until up to 17. So as young as five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'll try not to be too emotional, but when you share maternity with somebody, um, it's really kind of a mystery. I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of gift and blessing in that, right. That, um, the gift of those children, Ruth's children to me, right? They, you're, I'm going to cry. Your children are more of a blessing to you than you are to them, right? And that's a mystery we learn as we grow into our motherhood. And so you recognize that you're so grateful, sublimely grateful for someone else's passing their children to you in a sense, right? Um, kind of willingly. And, but then that somebody, but then there's this, there's this tragedy in it, right? And so it's this kind of mystery of, of death and, and joy, um, and I don't know how else to put it, right? That, but I think in every adoption, there's there's a there's a tragedy, and then there's this huge blessing and this huge gift, and it's it's I think it's hard to talk about. So when I dedicated the book to Ruth's children, um, I did so because those children, Ruth's children, have been such a blessing to me, and they mean so much in my life. But I also meant to include, you know, the the shared maternity that we have because they're they're also my children. Um, but they're also her children. So that is why the book is dedicated to Ruth's children. You're such a wonderful role model, Catherine, because you're highly educated, very accomplished, successful, and doing this great work, you know, yeah. leading a department at yeah. the university, mm-hmm. uh, at the Catholic yeah. University of America. Yeah. So this is a lot of accomplishments. You're an economist, you're a PhD, yeah. you have this book. You have also 14 children mm-hmm. under your mm-hmm. care. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, there's a lot of questions I have for you. So thanks yeah. for sitting down. Sure. I want to talk about your book. I also am very yeah. curious about sure. your personal approach to yeah. work and motherhood mm-hmm. um, and adoptive motherhood mm-hmm. too. Yes. 
Can I ask you, what was it like when you were starting your marriage <laughs> already with six children, yeah. one as young as five, right? who loved their mother yeah. who had passed from cancer and, yes. and then the, the wounds and traumas that can come with that. Right. And then you go on to have your own eight children. Yeah. What was that like starting out? Yeah. Um, well, I would be sanitizing it if I said it was just sort of like it all worked out um, easily and it was um, easy. It, it all worked out, but it took a long time. What was it like? It was really hard. <laughs> it was really, really hard. I definitely didn't know what it meant to adopt children who were, uh, yeah, I didn't know what it meant at all. I mean, I felt deeply called to that marriage. Um, I felt that God had, had put my husband in my in my life and that I had an opportunity to say yes. Um, I wasn't, I don't know what kind of certainty we can have in life, right? I, I, but I thought, it was as clear as anything could be that this was a, a good decision. Um, I trusted that God would provide, but humanly speaking, I had no idea. <laughs> so no, I didn't have any idea. So we got married and, you know, I came back, I like to say, I came back from my honeymoon and was like, who are all these people? <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know them very well. And, um, and so it was, it was a lot, it was a lot to learn. Um, and I, I would say, well, and I like to say how long it took, um, because, I know many people, but people who hear about us sometimes reach out, well, you know, I married a widower or I married a widow. Um, it doesn't feel right yet. It doesn't feel normal, but it took us a long time. And I like to say it was, a, it was probably, it was probably five years until I thought like I could sort of relax. Like, I think it's going to be okay. Like these are my kids too. Yeah. And yeah. I'm able to really yeah. and love them and yeah. in the way and they Yeah. And I would need. say like the ups and downs of sort of feeling like you've made a home together, right? Mm -hmm. So people use this language of blended family. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we we hear that language in relation to divorced and remarried households. Um, but I think families who who suffer the loss of a parent and have to blend or adopted homes, adoptive homes from different households. My, you know, dearest friend has adopted from foster care. All of these are ways that we try to build a domestic um, community together, right? And as a family. And so we're, here we are asserting the mystery and the truth about the institution of the family and how and how healing it is and how it, it works. And it works outside of the merits of our ability. And that was a lesson that I would not have learned if I hadn't been put in a situation where I didn't have the ability to do this. I really didn't. Now, I kind of thought that it, I, well, I don't know what I thought. I kind of thought I could just put a lot of effort into it and it would work out. Um, and I did put a lot of effort in, but you know, only later you realize that the things that worked worked outside of your mm. ability and they work because the, because the married, um, the married family tapped into grace is, is a thing that's very powerful and it heals and it, um, it transforms and it, it shelters and allows life to kind of grow up underneath it, its its boughs, right? But I didn't know all that. And so, you know, you think, okay, I have to do that. I have to, you know, I have to read stories. I'm going to figure out what they like. I mean, like all those things that you think you're, and I think you do those things. And that was overwhelming and it took, took a long time. So it took, I would say for me, five years till we would sit down at the table for dinner. And I would think like, we're kind of a family. Mm -hmm. Um and you had your own, yeah. you, were, you had additional children by that point. By that point, we had a couple. And actually, I'm glad you m reminded me to mention that because um, that's something I talk about at the end of the book, um, which is probably the most moving thing. I mean, one of the most moving things I heard in the research for this book. Um, I just mentioned how difficult it was to feel one, to feel like a family. Um, when we got married, a lot of people said, you should try not to have children. At um, all at all, or at least for a while, you know, that it would be too much or too traumatic that, um, you know, here we had all these children who are grieving and would it be too complicated for there to be, you know, you've got these children and then you're going to be pretty complicated. And we, we thought that was a really sort of a depressing idea. <laughs> and on the other hand, you think like I was young and I thought, well, maybe, yeah, maybe they're right. You know, these children are grieving. I don't really know. We got married and we thought, well, we'll just see what happens. We'll see what happens for a little while. And then we'll sort of just take stock and see how everybody's doing. And if, if we, no baby has come, you know, we'll kind of take that as a sign. We should um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe wait or something. Um, but God bless us with a baby probably on our on our wedding day. <laughs> so, you know, so much so that, you know, it was like, oh, that's a little bit shocking. Um, mm -hmm. But I, the reason I say it is because he was born, you know, nine months um, after we got married, almost exactly. 
And, um, if I, if I knew in advance how much that child would serve to help draw us together, Mm -hmm. I would have like gone out to try to do that earlier. You know, I like would have figured it out. Um, so actually having welcoming new life into our kind of grieving, blended, awkward family, it turned out to be the best thing we could have done. And of course, that was another lesson about God's providence that, you know, kind of babies aren't ever going to be the problem. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because this is a premium product made from the best materials for your little one. And everylife.com is a pro-life company. When you go to everylife.com slash join, you can join the Changing Lives Club. This way you can set up a subscription to get your diapers and your wipes, these premium products delivered right to your door for your little one. And after three months of the subscription, you will be able to donate for free a month's supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So what are you waiting for? Go to everylife.com slash join. Join the Changing Lives Club. Use the code LILA at checkout. Get 10% off your order, start your subscription, and after three months, you can donate a full month supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So I think that's a driving thesis of this book. Mm-hmm. Babies aren't ever going to be the problem, yeah. Um, yeah. including from the economic, <laughs> you know, societal yes. approach of what's best for a, right. a civilization. Right. And there's so much in here. I mean, yeah. clearly this was yeah. written by a PhD in economics because there's all the, <laughs> you know, you trace the history of thought yeah. on population yeah. decline and yeah. growth. And, you know, you talk about with Malthus, mm-hmm. you talk about right. these different theories about uh, what population means. And then of course you, you also yeah. interview, how many women did you interview yeah, who were 55, 55 women? And how many children did these women um, have? They had at least five. We were after people doing something definitely different. So yeah, five children. And what was more. the genesis for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what originated for you this book? Was it, I mean, you already are having your own kids, but, and then I know you care about the sure. economic impacts of population decline, but what was the appro- the approach you took yeah. of interviewing this set of 40 plus women who have this certain number of children? What, right. Why that approach? Yeah. Um, well, it seemed to me, and I would just attribute it to a, a grace or kind of an insight. It would it sort of hit me one day. Um, everybody studying birth rate decline is just studying birth rate decline. <laughs> So um, is it the case that there's no examples of exceptions to that? Are there places where people are not suffering birth rate decline? And so and so I thought, well, of course there are, you know, I'm, I know places. I mean, of course, we've had a lot of kids. And I thought, well, like, are we just like nobody could learn anything from that? And I thought, well, you know, you don't want to generalize from your own case. So you think, well, um, what could we learn by looking around and trying to discover uh, are there common factors to people who are a sort of immune from this declining birth rate? Um, so it's a little bit more interesting than it first sounds, right? When you first think about it, you go, well, well, actually, this is a principle. We do this all the time, right? So if you say, well, suppose you had a country where people were generally very unhealthy. Um, suppose you only studied lack of health, right? Um, would you ever learn the kinds of things that help people become fit and healthy? Um, in other words, healthfulness is not merely not being unhealthy, right? Like you have to think, what what drives people to get off the couch and become fit and active. Well, there's a whole bunch of steps and there's things that can drive them and motivate them. And then there's real habits, things you have to know mm-hmm. and things that you can do. So I thought, well, actually this is a principle. It's true in public health as well. You kind of go, where are people healthy? Who, who's not getting sick with this disease? So I realized that actually, if you think about it as where people are having children, um, that's kind of a clue. It may be a clue. It might provide clues to what we need to, to do. Right. And so if you went around and you talked to all these people with five or more children, and we can talk about why five, it's not really, not really a meaningful number. It was just for the purposes of the research. But if you went around and talked to a bunch of people who were not experiencing population collapse, would you find out that they were, let's say, you know, people with all a weird birthmark or something? So if you did, you said, well, you know, you have to have a purple birthmark to avoid population collapse. Well, you'd go talk to Washington, D.C. and you'd say, there's nothing you can do about it, right? The only people who are going to be immune to this have these special birthmarks. If on the other hand, you find out there's things you can believe, there's things you can do, there's habits of, of life, those are things that you can cultivate. If you cultivate those things, there'll be more babies. And so, of course, I had a hunch it wasn't the birthmark, <laughs> you know, but, you know, nobody had done this. Nobody had said, let's go find out. What do people think? What do they believe? And what are they doing? All right. So before we dive into all of that, mm-hmm. there's so much there. Yeah. 
give us the statistics yeah. on what mm-hmm. population really looks like right. in the West and mm-hmm. globally yeah. and why it's a concern. Yeah. Um, so the, the simple way to think about it is that about each woman has to have about two children in her lifetime for a population <clears throat> at large. So she replaces herself and her partner and that creates a, a stable, non-growing, non-drinking population. And um, any anything less than two children is a, will, over another couple of generations will lead to shrinking population. And so um, the statistics around in the United States and around the globe, we in the United States have one, about 1.6 children per woman. So that's pretty significantly below that kind of magic number of two. Um, and around the world, that is the general trend. In fact, we've been a little late to that party. So we were a little bit after some other countries, notably most of Europe, um, especially Western Europe, now Eastern Europe too. Um, and, and, you know, Japan, we know Japan started its population shrinking already in 2008, I think. China started shrinking last year. Um, South Korea has 0.7 children expected per woman. So, so very, very low birth rates and around the world. And it's really, there's no continent that isn't, uh, that isn't touched by this. So, so that means that within another couple of generations, we'll begin to see peak population in the whole world and population decline. What are the consequences of population decline? I was going to just say that we, it's not necessarily good. Um, So we've heard so much about overpopulation that it, I think probably most people think like, oh, phew, we dodged a bullet. Like that, isn't that good? Like it's good. Will it be declining? Um, And and it's probably better to step back from the world for a minute and just think about a particular country. But when you think about like the cities that have experienced sort of, you know, real population decline, what we're thinking about is those cities and towns in many parts of rural America where people have just moved away. Mm. When people move away and you think, well, what does that look like? Nobody's staffing the 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 stores. You can't sit at, there's no diners anymore. It's kind of like ghost town looking. Um, the way to call that is economic um, contraction. So kind of, you can't have growth. A bust, not a boom. <clears throat> a bust, not a boom. The second thing really simply is that it will definitely lead to more political instability. Why? Why, why does why does a, because people, a lessening population people lead to are the ultimate instability? resource? Because people want to be able to grow, they want prosperity. Right, everybody does. Um, that's why people come here. Um, that is the that is the the golden fleece in a sense. And so when there are when there is an increasing shortage of people. Mm-hmm there will be political instability. I mean, look at our times now, just debates about immigration, but that will be, there will be instability because people will be trying to figure out how to replace their populations. And that will not, uh, not probably be a really, uh, a really peaceful process. But the debate right now about Mm -hmm. immigration is largely, there is too much illegal immigration. Yes, 100%. So it's seen as a bad thing. And it's talked about typically in negative terms, which, you know, immigration can be a phenomenal, it's a necessary, I mean, I think it's a very wonderful advantage, especially to a country that has declining population. But that being said, it is talked about in a very negative way. Why do you think that is? What? um, I think... Well, I think largely in this country, the political rhetoric has been mixed up because of the illegal immigration mm-hmm. and the way that this process is not, it's not, it's not fair. Mm-hmm. It's not safe. Um, I think it's been largely mixed up, but then I do think that there's been a, a sort of a side rhetoric, which has maybe kind of ca- got wind along with this other thing, uh, that is, um, I think, I think deeply sort of, I think it's deeply hostile to, to people who might undermine a way of life. Mm-hmm kind of thing. There's and there's been a collective memory loss of the good of of good immigration and how much that was a mm-hmm. part of making this country great. Mm-hmm. I mean what made this country great. Um and that just I mean I think that cuts to the core of a very deep question which is, you know, do our our strangers threats our mm-hmm. our our friendly strangers threats, you know, what how do we know, you know, what makes someone a threat? Are people a threat? Um and and that sort of now, you know, start to go from strangers, our strangers threats, our friendly strangers threats are are, peop- are are your neighbors a threat? You know, how many people is a baby a threat? A very, is the big yes, and now we're getting closer and closer to that. Question. That is an existential question, mm-hmm. and I do think that it's fair to point out that for many people, an inchoate sense or a vague sense that the place they live or the city they they love is going to be inhabited by all kinds of people they don't know. I think it's related to this very existential mm-hmm. question of how much my comfort can be can be. Um, uh, 
maybe tested, affected, yeah. tested by other people. So, yeah. so is there such a thing mm -hmm. as overpopulation? Yeah. I mean, overpopulation assumes yeah. that there's too many yeah. people. Right. So let's just yeah. say there is, let's say everyone is having right. five children mm -hmm. minimum, right? Mm -hmm. The population mm -hmm. is absolutely yeah. replacing itself. It's growing. It's growing. And yeah. it's growing, I think, dramatically that, yeah. that, that is yeah. great, right? Yeah. And again, on average, if everyone is on average having five yeah. kids, that means there's a bunch of people having like 10 kids right? because right. some people won't be able to have children <laughs> mm -hmm. or they choose not to, you know, they're not married yeah. or whatever reason. So this is right. an average, right. but let's say people on average are having big families. Right. How would that affect? Let's yeah. just talk about America. How yeah. would that affect our economy in America? You're yeah. an economist. Right. Is that the goal? Is that a good goal to strive for? And, and yeah. are there are there side effects or disadvantages? I mean, there's certainly the population yeah. controller agenda saying, yeah. you know, well, this is going to hurt the environment. Right. The carbon footprint is going to be insane. It's mm -hmm. going to, you know, create climate change. It's going to destroy cities and right. the coastal regions and have, you know, heat, heat you know, right. heat strike in parts of the country. And it's going to transform the globe as we know it in a bad way. Way. Yeah. What yeah. do you say to all that? Yeah. Okay. So let's, um, let's pick it apart a little bit. Um, seven weeks coffee is America's pro-life coffee company on a mission to fund the pro-life movement. One cup of delicious coffee at a time. Why are they called seven weeks coffee? Because at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and it's the same time that the heartbeat can be first clearly detected on ultrasound. That's why Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of every sale to support pregnancy resource centers across the country. Seven Weeks Coffee is harvested from the top 1% to 2% of beans in the world. Their beans are mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, and low-acid, and they're organically farmed. Seven Weeks Coffee truly checks all the boxes. And just in time for the holiday season, Seven Weeks Coffee is having their biggest promotion yet. You can enjoy exclusive discounts, free gifts with every order, and new limited edition coffees. And exclusively for my listeners, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your order. We've experienced certainly periods of time in which population has grown rapidly. Um, and it's, you know, in historical terms, it's always been good for people. Um, is there overpopulation? There isn't now overpopulation. There hasn't been overpopulation in terms of not enough resources. The people that have existed have contributed to prosperity. They haven't actually undermined prosperity. And that occurs, I mean, economists believe it occurs because people are not stomachs. They're, they're also minds, mm. right? So each person isn't just gobbling up resources. They're also consuming goods and services and they're innovating and creating and, and contributing. And what we see is that basically people contribute more in their lifetime than they take away. And that's true on the individual level of a household and a family. That's this principle. But it also turns out to be true for, for countries and for nations. So that's the first point is that the population growth we've had in the past hasn't been bad for us. It's been really good for us. Um, and we could connect together, of course, you know, the it's a little bit oversimplifying. Oversim if we thought about intellectual history, we can connect together these population bomb people like Paul Ehrlich. Mm -hmm. We can connect them together with Planned Parenthood, with the eugenics movement. I mean, kind of, they're just variations on a theme, right? They're, this, they're playing the same tune. And the same tune is that um, either there's too many people simpliciter, that's Paul Ehrlich, or you're Margaret Sanger, and there's too many of the wrong people, right? And if and the solution is always get rid of the people, not kind of figure out how to solve the problem of like, maybe we need better water systems here. Maybe we need, right? So the, so the mindset's always, there's a finite, like there's the working supposition, right? With all yeah. of this is that yeah. there's a finite number of resources. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, uh, you know, people are saying they're just going to yeah. take up too many resources. And, you know, Margaret Sanger, she, a lot of her ideology was born out of her own family mm -hmm. story. Yeah. She was one of many children. Yeah. Her parents had a lot of struggle. Her mother was very sick. Right. Then she goes to the slums of New York. She sees, you know, immigrant children who are being raised in extreme yeah. poverty, women who are being beaten by their husbands. And she just yeah. says, this whole project is ridiculous. Right. Let's just give them birth control and later abortion just so mm -hmm. that they don't have kids. Or if they have a kid, they're, they're wealthy enough and they right. have only one or two. Right. And, and, you know, she went on to kind of pioneer the two child policy, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. China adopted later on. I yes. mean, that was a Margaret Sanger original <laughs> idea. Let's have a two child policy and yeah. the government gives you a permit to have a baby. A permit to have a baby. Uh, that was literally Margaret Sanger. <laughs> Most people don't know that. So, so, but, but, but it's, but the whole, you know, the, 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 the premise of all yeah. of it is there's a finite number of resources. Yes. Finite and resources. And you're an yeah. economist and you're yeah. saying that is not true. It's not true. Like, for all intents and purposes, resources are infinite 
And, it, you know, it takes a while to sort of explain that. This is not intuitive. I think it's very intuitive to think about sort of these lifeboat ideas and there's fixed resources. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of pieces of that puzzle. One of the pieces is the one I already mentioned that people come and they, they add more resources than they take away. And that's almost mysterious. You have to understand how economic growth works. So growth creates wealth and wealth isn't the stuff. Um, it's not the, the, the wood and the, the metals that we use and the food. That's not the wealth. The wealth is how it's combined to make life better for us. How it's used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what we see over time is in fact, um, resource, um, re transferal of resources. So we don't, we don't heat our homes with wood anymore. We don't burn wood anymore and we don't burn coal anymore. And those are both great things, right? So, so coal isn't the resource that it used to be. And of course, a lot of people would like to see a future in which we use even less coal. Mm -hmm. We don't use wood anymore for sure. And so what took place, we didn't get more resources. It's not that, you know, people were born and we had more coal, but that in that process of more people figuring out better ways to do things, it turns out we don't need those things anymore. We can use more um, energy dense things. We don't like you have to use so many trees to get one amount of heat, right? So we use more things that are more energy dense. The, en the engines that we have become more efficient and we think we're in the middle of an energy transformation now, right? So then you think, well, is that just energy? Well, no, it turns out that's true with food. It's true with land. It's true with the cleanliness of our resources that in general, as it looks as if that more people would take away, but in fact, more people make things better. They, they bring down the cost of resources. And so, you know, I, I would be um, remiss if I didn't quote the work of the great, the late, great Julian Simon, who is certainly the most well-known economist who did just, you know, decades of work on this question. Um, so he uses this word that, you know, for all intents and purposes, resources are infinite, which is amazing. And it requires, you know, you look at the facts and you say, okay, why and how? So that's important to, to, to do. But I also want to make sure we don't miss the other reason that this is wrong. The reason that overpopulation isn't something to worry about is because people don't breed like rabbits. And this is something that's been missed by the Malthusians and the population control people. Um, and that's maybe something we can talk more about, but um, it's, there's never been a kind of fixed propensity to just have a certain number of children. It's not fixed. At any given moment, every couple, every household, every man, woman um, making these decisions, they're deciding on the basis of all kinds of things, like how to use their time. And of course, the reproductive revolution um, makes it even easier for couples to kind of decide what's valuable to them. What we have seen, for better or worse, what we've seen is that as societies become more wealthy, uh, households choose fewer children. So there's another reason why as kind of time marches on and resources become more abundant, they don't run out because it turns out that people have fewer children. Well, that's what I want to probe most. And your book, yep. of course, does this yep. because I don't think that's a good trend. Yeah. I think that using our wealth to then stop having children and create more resources, mm -hmm. the most beautiful resource in the world is a human yep. being. Yeah. Like you said, there's an infinity there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about someone like an Elon Musk yeah. and he talks about wanting to go to Mars. He wants right. to build, you know, SpaceX, all this stuff. And it's like, you know, the more, let's just imagine a world right. where every woman did have five children mm -hmm. plus. Mm -hmm. And let's just imagine that, you know, Enough right. hundred years from now, I don't know, I'm not going to be able to do the math right in this moment, you know, the That's global right. population times yeah. that over yeah. generations. Yeah. Let's just say that physically every, you know, square foot, there was not enough physical space, but right. we learned how to use the resources for enough food yeah. and, you know, organizing yeah. ourselves, et cetera, because right. we, technology gets better and better. Mm -hmm. And then we do need to. Yeah. take over other planets, do space. I mean, <laughs> yeah. the world's, you know, literally yes. the sky's the, the, the there sky's is the no limit. limit. Yeah. You say the sky's the yeah. limit, the sky's actually not, not the, the limit. limit. We've just learned. Yeah. And so <laughs> that's what I'm interested in because, you know, you yeah. made this comment yeah. about, you know, well, even as the culture gets wealth, wealthier, mm -hmm. then they, they kind of choose to have less children and mm -hmm. every family has these choices. Yeah. Don't you think that whole idea of like choosing to have children mm -hmm. is such a modern idea when it comes to people who are already married, like it was a, it was a, it was a no brainer yeah. for, you right. know, millennia yeah. among human beings that if, especially if you're married, right. the project of marriage is you're open to children. You yes. don't always get them, right. but you often do. Right. And then you celebrate that and you work hard yeah. and it's not easy. Life is not yeah. about easy. It's about meaning. And that's the way it goes. Instead of this idea of, should we start our family now? Yes. 
How much family should we have? Will we stop our family now? I mean, <laughs> these are modern questions. Yeah. And yes, you can do those questions even without, you know, birth control. Yeah. But even those questions without birth control, there's a there's a there's a premise there mm -hmm. that says there's a premise there. What what yeah. pre you and you tackle okay. this in the book. Yeah. So I think what you're what you're working through, um, okay, so first of all. I think this is one of the hardest topics I've ever tried to think hard about. Um, right. So I just want to say that. So I <laughs> thank think, you for thinking no, about it for no, us. <laughs> like, well, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm done, you know, but I, I but I just want to say that because what I'm about to say may, might sound um, overly complicated, but I think, I think it's worth pausing to figure mm -hmm. it out. Um, and I, you know, and I would say that like, I'm, I'm, I'm in a journey trying to figure this mm -hmm. out. Um, what I think we want to try to distinguish is between this modern sense that like the baby is a choice, the child is a choice. Um, and certainly the, uh, something that you and I are both, um, are both committed to trying to work against the baby now conceived is a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is insane. Um, that Meaning you can abort the baby, yeah, you can baby, opt out on the baby, right? This baby yeah. is a life that exists. Um, and so I think we, but obviously that thing, that abhorrent thing that mm -hmm. a conceived baby could be opted against after, after a living human being, that is absolutely abhorrent. Um, it's been wrapped up with this silly language of choice, which is absurd, right? Um, so, okay, let's set that aside. And so, yeah, this leaning into this language of choice, reproductive choice, like all of that has become very odd. Okay. But what I want to say for just a quick second, like a hot minute, take a minute, take all the time you want. <laughs> Did we, um, we certainly don't want to believe, but I want to point this out. We don't want to believe, and I don't think it's true, that um, childbearing was kind of animal-like mm. and um, n not something not something that m m men and women made decisions about in as kind of the office of their married mm. life. Even mm. if that decision meant we are open to God's will for our marriage, we we know and we see that marriage is marriage is a is a choice right it's a choice to be married and we affirm that you know every day you have to keep making that choice not because you have some sort of choice to walk away right like that's not a choice but that um you're a full agent in this thing and that your your responsibility comes from the fact mm -hmm. that you need to choose to be in this you need to choose to love we say this a lot that like love is a choice it's not a feeling um and one of the one of the problems that I'm one of the things that I'm troubling through and I'm working through, and I think we're both in this place, is that we want to, at the same time, reject the language of reproductive choice as it's used today, because it's used in a way that isn't choice, <laughs> isn't a choice. But I think um, what I'm discovering, thinking about the past, what did people do in the past? I don't think they just unthinkingly had children. Mm. I think they made responsible and good decisions. Um, just as I think most people today make responsible and good decisions, um, but they are decisions. So we, we wouldn't want to strip away from the childbearing, um, process, the importance of making a decision. Um, and so this is the sense in which, um, you know, now you're sitting across from a, like an annoying economist who's going to say, love it. I what's love the it. moment <laughs> of choice? But I think this is, I think this is, um, this is an insight that I, I mentioned a little bit, it kind of goes back to an Aristotelian, um, conception of the person as someone who's always making a choice for the perceived mm -hmm. good. Right. And, and so this is this, it's only when you start to view the, I would say the drama of the, of the inner person that you can reject this Malthusian idea. It's really important to reject that because what Margaret Sanger basically thinks is that poor people are just going to copulate and have children like animals. And Malthus basically thinks that anybody who can will copulate and have children like animals. Oh, and I think that and, of, of kids too, like it, kids are yes, so sexual. Yes. So just give them condoms. Yes. And it's like, it, there's it, a choice you can make exactly. to not have sex. That's exactly. a choice. Right. Exactly. So like we, we think about like what's behavior, behavior is like something that comes out of this, the drama of human choice. And that mm -hmm. choice has to be formed. Hopefully it is formed and informed by the right things and our consciences are formed properly. So, um, okay. So that's the way I want to untangle this. Mm -hmm. So I certainly agree with you entirely that this modern notion of reproductive choice is, is not helpful, hasn't been helpful. On the other hand, I definitely want mm -hmm. to, um, cultivate and bring to the forefront an element that I think has been, been lost. And the reason it's important to do that is because it's exactly the key to, to, to sort of going forward today. 
it's the key, right? Because we're not like lab rats. Mm -hmm. If we were lab rats, um, we could kind of put a little bit more sugar in the water or we could like, you know, nudge us into some kind of place. We could just apply the right treatment to the rats and we'll all start having a few more babies. Like it's like something we can adjust, like almost like pulling the levers. If instead, what is the key to the decisions that we make about children is something that's really in this drama of value. What do people value? Then that's the way to sort of go at the problem. So one final piece to talk about the past. So I think in cultures um, prior to our own, where we were less wealthy, why did people have children? Did they have children because they didn't know how to not have children? And I think the answer is that's not right. I think people had children because children were deeply valuable um, in ways that they're not today. And I think that's really important to emphasize. If you lived on a farm, you had lots of domestic animals, you had to take, you know, you better have more than one kid, <laughs> right? And so we like to think like, well, they mm. just didn't know how to not have children. Is is that the case? Are you saying they were economically they were though, economically valuable, valuable children? You couldn't have a good life. You'd be like, you're going to do all of the care of all the domestic animals by yourself. Mm. Actually, you'd have a better life as an adult human being if you had more children. Now, I'm not saying that cultures in the past where children were valued economically in that sense, or they, you know, I don't mean that they, that they were valuable as an objective fact. They made it easier to take care of farms and households. They took care of you in your old age. Mm -hmm. We didn't have pension programs and big savings accounts. And retirement, right, high, retirement com high complex, high yeah, risk complexes. And so if you are going to count your children mm -hmm. to take care of you, this is a very economic reason. We would call that an economic reason. Um, so children brought value to the household in a way that they certainly don't today. And I think if we look at the past and we sort of assume, oh, everybody really treasured children for their own sake mm -hmm. in the past, I think that's facile. I'm not convinced that that would be clear. And there are lots of times in human history where different cultures have have, have rejected the idea of having children or thought that it would be better to, you know, certainly um, expose the weak and the vulnerable. We've had religious sects who got into thinking that, you know, maybe you know, not being married was a better idea, you know, so you got all these sorts of things. Um, so I think fundamentally, when you look at like even 200 years ago in this country, children were, were valuable in, in ways that they're not today. So I, I'm not sure I would, would want to be so quick to look at today's young people, mm -hmm. young adults trying to make decisions about when to have children. You look at somebody who's 28, 29, 30, there's certainly no part of them that's going to sit down and think, well, our life would be a lot better if we had a couple more kids. Did you know that every year, 200,000 families go bankrupt from medical bills, even with health insurance? For many people, insurance is simply not working for them. That's why I'm excited to share with you about Crowd Health, which is an alternative model for paying for your health care. Crowd Health takes your bills, personally negotiates them on your behalf, and then sends out a request to the community to help cover your bills. The Crowd Health community has fully funded more than 5,000 medical bills over the last two years. This includes accidents like a young woman in Tennessee who lost her fingers in a boating accident to NICU babies and cancer cases. Keep in mind, Crowd Health is not the same thing as insurance, but it is an alternative model to help pay medical bills and keep your monthly costs low. So go to Join Crowd Health today. Use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. There's certainly no part of them that's going to sit down and think, well, our life would be a lot better if we had a couple more kids. Now, Meaning once they've had their one or their two. Once they've, I mean... Because I think there's a lot of people today that they want to like cross the threshold of having a child or maybe up to three. Like yeah. that's, that's pretty average, you know, that one or two. Average. That's right. Because it's a kind of a coming of age. There's, there's, there's so much beauty in a kid. I mean, yeah. even the modern person, yeah. we see that. And so there's this, uh, I think it is baked in as much as some of this other stuff is baked in. It well, is baked in that, you know, one or two or three might be a great thing. Yes. So I am definitely not here to say that there are sort of non-economic reasons mm -hmm. to have children. I think there are, but I think that it's, it's, it's powerful to look at the last couple of hundred years and see, okay, um, there are intrinsic reasons to have children. Children are intrinsically good. They're good in themselves. And even if they brought you no benefit, even if it was a lot of hardship, there's a very strong case to have children. And we could make that case. 
there's also in times past economic reasons to have children. So what we're seeing today, I really think is the strip, we've stripped away all the non-economic reasons. And so what's left is who's having children, people who've become very persuaded either from their own background or from a religious conversion that children are intrinsically worth having. And they're worth rearranging your life to get going on that project, you know, younger rather than waiting until you're 39 to just have one. Um, and so that's, yeah. I think that's the big message is that actually, if you want to find out who's resisting this birth rate decline, it's people who have some other reason besides an economic reason to have children. So who are these groups that are having children? Mm. Um, well, uh, the shorthand message is <laughs> they're devout religious people. Um, the longer message is not of any one particular faith. So when I say devout, um, they tend to be people who believe a very specific two or three things about children and marriage. And you can find them among many faiths. And I found them in all across the country, LDS, Jewish, Catholic, Baptist, um, Presbyterian, I mean, all manner of, of different Christian churches. But in none, none of these churches does it seem to be that everybody believes this. And so it's not just religiousness. That's a, it's a very specific set of beliefs that I think when, when I say them, they sound pretty biblical, which is why I invoke the biblical Hannah in this book. Um, there are people who believe that children are blessings. Mm. And you get it out of your mouth and you go like, oh, is that all? Wait, you're really telling me that could be the key? And you say, well, doesn't everybody think children are blessings? Well, maybe not, not in the way that these women do. So one of the ways I help to give people a sense of what do they mean when they say they're blessings, they believe children are blessings in exactly the way that someone might think wealth is a blessing, mm. right? So you'd never say, you know, I'm kind of done accumulating wealth. Like I'm done. I'm, I'm rich enough. I've, once or twice you hear someone say that, you know, like that's it. I, I can't accumulate anymore. I'm going to give it away. But, or they might say, I hit 10, 15 uh, million, yeah, I don't know. And they're like, right. I have enough to live off, so I'm going to stop trying. That's right. And when we remember that wealth isn't just um, money or cash money or assets, it could be many different things, mm. actually defined more, more metaphysically, mm. no one's done being wealthy mm. and no one's done being healthy. No one says, I'm as fit as I need to be. Like, I'm done. I could kind of slack off now. Like, I'm going to go back to my old life health and wealth aren't the types of things that you ever think you'd be done having. So, so when I say these are women who think children are blessings, they mean it in that way. And they didn't think in the words of one woman I interviewed, they didn't think you could have too many children any more than you could be too wealthy or too healthy. Um, and so that's where I say, well, yeah, everybody says that ch their children are blessings in a, in a, maybe a trite way or cliche way, but this is what they meant. They really believe that each extra child intrinsically different from the last mm. one, unique, has a divine purpose, brings a gift to the world that no other child could bring. So those are the kinds of things. These are very biblical notions. They didn't all use exactly the same language, but there was a lot of overlap. Um, so that they believe that children are blessings, expressions of God's goodness and the purpose of their marriages. And I think that last one is important to say. Um, it, the, this is kind of the core of the thing, you know, um, how did people get there? Well, that's really interesting. Not everybody grew up in a big religious family. Some people had a religious conversion and came to believe that then had a few kids and went, yeah, it's all true. Everything that I believe is true. I'm going to keep going. Um, other women, uh, grew up in large families and came at marriage and motherhood already knowing like, this is the best thing you can do in life. I'm going to try to have as many as God will send me. I might say try, right? Because as you said, mm. you can't go buy children. They, you, you may want them, you may be open to them, but they're a gift. So I, you know, it's so baked in, in our culture mm -hmm. today to not see children that way. Yep. And I actually personally encounter this. I'm going to guess you might too, yeah. but I personally encounter this virtually every time I go somewhere public with my with only children. three children. Mm -hmm. I only have yeah, three, people. <laughs> but I'm youngish and I've got three and they're all little. Mm -hmm. And virtually every time I go out in public yeah. with my kids, there yeah. are kind words spoken. They're so yeah. cute. Like da, da. Mm -hmm. But then there's always a question or a comment in this vein. Yeah. Um, three, you've got your hands full. Are you, are or you, you got your girl? Are you done? Are you done? I was going to say, that's the language. Are you done? Or three, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I have one or two, you know, yep. like, yep. so, um, you know, and then I, I often, I, I always say, oh, I hope we have more. Yeah. I would love to yeah, have to, more. Just to, and they look yeah. at me and, and <laughs> I, as if I'm an, like a, an alien. 
And again, this is like yeah. 95% of people that I yeah. encounter who has some kind of conversation with me about my kids just mm-hmm. out in, in, the, in the world. Yeah. And, um, and I know many other women who have ex- similar yeah. experiences. And again, it's not that people are trying to be mean or impolite. This right. is literally how they make small talk. It is, no, that's because right. it's baked in. It's completely baked in. That this idea having of a limitation. child is this like big, big deal to the point that, you know, you would have a child. And then mm-hmm. if you have two or Three. Yeah. Again, I only have three. Yeah, yeah. You know, th- think about the mom who has six or you have eight, right? Or more. Yeah. Um, that it is kind of a shocker. It's yeah. a shocker it's a that shocker. you would have so yeah. many kids. Right. Why would like, you do why that? Why would you do why that? Why would you do that? How yeah. do we get to the point where instead of yeah. children, and again, I don't want to use that language either, because to your yeah. point, it's, it's, it's yeah. important to not use that language because it's not like, oh, a hundred years ago, everyone mm-hmm. understood children were a blessing. Yeah. I don't know that that's necessarily true. They yeah. understood they were economically important. But yeah. to, it, I don't want to pretend like the past is perfect and we, we're now yeah. on this devol- you know, devolution has happened. But the reality is the truth is yeah. that children are blessings. Yes. But we don't see that truth today. And it's very baked in for even yeah. good people to not see that truth. Yeah. Can you believe that it's almost the end of 2024 and soon it will be Christmas? If you want time to slow down and focus on God, especially before this Christmas season, then I highly recommend Hallow. As you may know, Hallow is the number one prayer app in the world with thousands of guided meditations and prayers. There's also sleep stories, Bible stories, content for kids, and so much more. Go check it out today. Hallow.com slash Lila for three months free and join the Pray 25 prayer challenge with Hallow. Well, I want to help help out your history for a minute. So I think the re- I think those cultures didn't have children necessarily for these lofty reasons. But when you're in a culture where people have a higher birth rate, it becomes more apparent to people because in fact, it doesn't take you that long to see, right? Initially you're like, well, this is a lot of work and I don't know, this baby isn't even smiling at me. Mm -hmm. And then as the child gets older, you're kind of like, oh my goodness, wow, like this is the Mm -hmm. best thing ever, right? In cultures where people have more children, it becomes more apparent that children are blessings. Mm -hmm. And so I I, I don't necessarily want to completely say that people didn't think that, Mm -hmm. Um, or that it wouldn't have been easier to maintain that. I think they did. It's a good point. But the, the what gets you out of bed? Like, what? Sorry, what gets this thing going? It's like if you had to force me into an ice bath, which I, apparently people do this for health, but it would you would take a lot. You'd really have to push me in there. And so I think people needed that push, like the economic. Um, your point is, I think I think it's the money point that the reflexive thought of our culture is that having children is something that. It has to be done at some point. Mm. And it reveals that same idea about family. It's not even, it's not even the material resources. Many people look at you with your three. Mm. And Making they, me cry, Catherine. I know. Like, it's the so money. Sad. It is. It is yeah. so sad. It's the money point. And they mm. think, how can you love more than, more than three? Like, how could you, how can you even love three? Like, how do you have enough attention and how do you have enough, like, gift of your, how do you have enough of yourself mm. to do this? Right. I, I just think that's for me, that was like where I got, what I got out of this was like, that's the, that's the point. And actually that point, we all, we all didn't believe it, but mm. we did actually buy into this idea that there's a fixed number of people you can love. Like, great. Right? Like that's mm. it. You're at your point, your maximum. You right. can't love another child. I think that God is good to us in the way that he designed the world in such a way that we can learn from the things we can see about Mm -hmm. the things we can't see. I think that's so important. So just as the material research, like as, as the human population has grown, I mean, look at the world we live in, right? I mean, you know, not everything's perfect, but the, the vast number of people who live at a standard of living, this is wonderful at a standard of living that was not imaginable by Kings and Queens, you know, 400 years ago. We're all like the little, little me I'm driving around in this, you know, not an expensive car, but it just, I'm sure it's easier than a horse and buggy. I mean, there's so many beautiful things. Can you, can you share briefly yeah. on that? Just to pause for a moment, because I, I should have asked about this earlier, but yeah. it's such an important point yeah. just about the standard of living for like the populations, yeah. you know, this idea of like hunger and yeah. people not having basic necessities that... Yes. We've got, there's a, there's a website called humanprogress.org. Yeah. You're probably familiar it's where they wonderful. track this, Yes, but could you share just a, yeah. a briefly? Well, right. I mean, just maybe one, um, da- one data point yeah. that would be really helpful. If you just look at the, the, the century from 1900 to 2000. So now this is already 25 years behind us, the end of that century. 
um, at the beginning of that century, if you looked at the number of people in the, around the world um, who were um, in poverty, like at a kind of poverty level, you'd be looking at, you know, depending on the measure, somewhere between 80 and 90% of the world in, in poverty. By the end of that 100 years, this is the nature of economic growth, human progress. By the end of that 100 years, it had completely flipped around to the point where it would be like, you know, 10 to 15% in poverty and the 80 to 90% out of poverty. And not necessarily just just over the threshold, but, you know, really, really successfully out of poverty. So, and then we've made tremendous gains even since the year 2000. So in the last 25 years, I don't want to neglect that last, but that is just a, if you look at those graphs and you can find them on our world and data has some beautiful graphs about, about this sort of thing. And I, I think we have to celebrate that. I know that a lot of people get worried about, you know, the materialism and, and the things that are inherent in, in wealth. But from my perspective, economic growth is, is what God intended for the world for the sake of people is how, how should we expect our families to grow and our marriages to be generative and, and generous in that way, if it isn't the case that God provided some mechanism. And so, so what I was going to say then, and I think it's worth just n now that we see that jump, it's so huge, right? To go from 90% poor to 10% poor, right? That to, that's astonishing, right? Um, to go that this reveals something about the spiritual life and about, cause the most, we, we all kind of get it. Like you want to provide food and resources and shelter and a good education for your children. And that costs money or wherever you are, but you also want to give your kids love and attention and a relationship. And I think a lot of people are worried about that. Um, but in fact, in fact, it looks like your heart grows that, the hidden world that we don't see, our capacity to love actually can grow. We're not fixed. And that's shocking. It's actually kind of shocking, right? Because I think most of us think of ourselves as like some kind of spirit thing that's like a thing inhabiting our bodies. Right? Like, but our soul, our hearts actually can grow. And so as we have more children, you know, when that person who looks at you and aren't you done, it's kind of like, why would I want to be done? This is the best thing ever. And then you just discover that you you can love, you can love more. And you didn't know you could love more. Cause I don't know, I don't know about you, but when my first baby, I thought I couldn't love anybody like this again. Like, this is it. This is the pinnacle of the love you could experience, you know, and then you do have a second child. You go, wait, wow. Oh my goodness. I can love this one too. And it's, it's even bigger because now there's like a whole thing. There's like this whole nexus of, of love that we're all loving each other. And it's mm -hmm. amazing. So this is really interesting that just as just as more people don't deprive us of material resources, more people don't deprive us of our ability to love them. You said something really interesting. I mean, all of this is interesting, but earlier when we were talking about, you know, I was thinking specifically about being at a clothing store with the kids. And then this lady was saying, uh, you know, are you done and all of this? And you said, well, because they can't imagine being able to love more than one, two or three. I think there's other things that may be at work. And I know you've studied this which are other, maybe some existential fears mm -hmm. about w the world being overpopulated, climate yeah. change. So I think yes. that's a, a, maybe a some, small category. Yeah. It's a category. Yeah, it is. What are the different categories that you have studied mm -hmm. about the reasons people say that they don't want children or they only want one or two? Yeah. And then another question, mm -hmm. this is complex, but yeah. that's what they're saying, mm -hmm. maybe if they're yeah. surveyed, right. but maybe the operational beliefs that they're, they have, that they don't know that they have yeah. are the reason that they're actually not having the children right. or not having more than one or two. Yeah, that's right. And okay. also I'm combining yeah. categories that yeah, I probably yeah. shouldn't combine because no, no, the reasons of the people totally not fine. having any kids is probably a little different than those yeah. that are just having the one or the yeah. two. So th this is, they're both great questions and I'm going to mostly refer you to other work. Um, it took me so long to do this project. I haven't spent a lot of time interviewing people yet who don't have children or don't want children or don't want children yet. I just heard it on the airplane on the way here, like flying here. Um, I had my earbuds in and, but I could still hear like the, the aisle across, you know, there was a conversation and it was people who didn't know each other. So the one lady was talking to a couple and, you know, it was like, at some point it got around to, well, you know, oh, you've been married for five years. Do you want kids? And I, I was like, of course my ears perked up and I waited for it. It was like, not sure, not sure. And um, was the person like in their thirties? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I just thought this is so, this is so the reality. This is so what's happened. It's baked in. It's baked in. They don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. 
not sure, I think, and not sure goes on and on and on. It goes on. And then, you know, like, then it's maybe you're 39 and it's like, maybe I'm just going to try. Um, that not sure, I think is a really great summary of, of where we are. Um, so I haven't studied it directly. When I began this project, the intention was to go through all the different categories, not just to do the high fertility, like, you know, people who have a lot of kids, but actually to, to, to look at all the contours of American family life and to talk to people who've never wanted children. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, this took long enough. I'll get there. Um, but I want to refer you to another book, which I think is a little bit sober, uh, but, but I think really gets at what you just asked. It's called, um, what are children for? Two philosophers, Anastasia Berg and uh, Rachel Wiseman. Um, and they really do a tour of, of this sort. They interview people who are very unsure. And so they cover all those categories. What are the things people say? But as philosophers, they kind of push and they go a little bit deeper. And it does seem, I mean, their work, their work really sort of reveals that it really seems to come down to this basic question of, do they think life is valuable? Do they think their own lives are so valuable that they would want to reproduce them? I think that's a really, uh, a really interesting question. So it does seem that people need more than an assurance that they can afford children um, economically, which is not to not to make light of the fact that many people would like to have a better economy or, or better resources to raise their families, but that there's a when that when people I will, I'll put it this way when when people say I can't afford to have children, the language of affordability often can mask many things, mm -hmm. right? So I can't afford maybe the cash that might be one thing, might not be entirely true. Of course, in the first cut, you might say, well, but could you buy less of this and more? You could, could you reallocate the things you're already spending on children? Of course, most people probably could, but then there's like a deeper sense of affordability, right? Which is your time, your energy. So it's more like lifestyle affordability or identity affordability because you actually pay for your children with those things. Right? You pay for your children with yourself. Where do you think we got these standards for what is seen as the good life? Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's such a sense today of the good life. And I, I mean, yeah. social media can often get blamed or media in general, because we're, there's all these, you know, they talk about the unrealistic expectations and pictures painted for women, especially about lifestyle, the home, the parents, right. the perfect relationship, the perfect career, whatever. And right. so if they are not achieving certain things in their own life, then they're more hesitant to have mm -hmm. a child at all, or even one yeah. or two, or maybe beyond yeah. that. I think we're, we're digging deeply. I mean, this is like, where we're like, where does this come from? You know, and of course um, we could point to things on the surface, but I, I feel like the better, the better place to dig a little bit. And I'm speculating, we're really looking at the first generation of, of 20 somethings and 30 somethings. I cannot remember which generations I'm supposed to call them anymore. Gen Z and millennials. <laughs> right. And then what's the next one after alphas, but the, the Z's and the millennials are the first generation of uh, where we've had the majority of those generations grew up with some form of family dysfunction. And I think that family dysfunction is the kind of thing which makes you really struggle to figure out if you want to start a family, mm. right? This is, right, this is the, the, the divorce revolution is really when, it's really like the 1970s into the 80s. That's, that's the time when the divorce, the, we, we had no fault divorce, right? Um, and then we see this big backlog of divorces that people wanted for dumb reasons and those come, those, those happen. And then, then you see in the 1980s, this big argument in favor of the good divorce. We kind of, right. So it, I mean, my best explanation is mm -hmm. it's people carrying the wounds of, of family dysfunction. We know now that, um, the experience of, of loss that adults, um, carry with them from childhood, from childhood divorces and family separations, it's it's profound and it doesn't end. It doesn't end when you're 18, like some magic number, right? It doesn't end, you know, a few years after the divorce. It's something you carry with you into adulthood. The work of Judith Wallerstein, I think, is not widely circulated enough. And she said, I'm stunned. I cannot believe it that you've got people who are in their 30s and 40s afraid to start a family because they aren't, they don't want to do to their children what their parents did to them. And I feel like that's got to be something we have to tap. I mean, that with the tap is, but then, you know, you're looking at something again, it's not an easy solution, but there's a lot of pain behind, there's a lot of pain and suffering behind. I'm not sure I want to have a kid. 
What was the one of the most sur- surprising things that mm-hmm. you, or was there something that was surprised you that you yeah. encountered in your interviews mm-hmm. with these, you know, women who yeah. broke out of that mm-hmm. mindset? I mean, well, uh, yeah. And uh, one, uh, this is an additional question. I'm keep doubling up on you, but mm-hmm. were these were any of them the children of divorced parents, mm-hmm. and did that come into? Did that yes. influence their decisions at all? Yeah. So I'll go in, I'll go in order. Um, well, I'll go in backwards order of mm-hmm. just, yeah, there, there were many, many of the moms I interviewed were children of divorce. Um, in particular, uh, it comes out in, in the very last chapter, chapter, I think it's chapter 18, maybe it's chapter 17. I can't remember. It's the story of Leah. Mm-hmm. So Leah's a, a beautiful testimony. Her, her story is amazing. Um, her reflections on what it means to have children are just incredibly deep and beautiful. And she meant, she says at some point that, that she just really wants to explain that her commitment, um, as a Jewish woman to building a family that's permanent, Mm -hmm. really a lot of that is born, born, she says, as a child of divorce, I saw that it was important to put the, put the family first Mm -hmm. and put children first. And so it's clear that in some cases it can work out that that can motivate you. You know, people talk in psychology about modeling and remodeling and that, many people can remodel. They, they, they saw modeling is when you see your parents do things, you think they're pretty good, but a lot of people, um, don't want to do the th- same things your parents did. And so that remodeling is what you do when you say, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to give my kids something better and different. Um, but clearly it, it's more effort to have to remodel than to just go, Oh, you know, I have amazing parents and I hope I could just do everything that they did. Right. So there were definitely some people who had been had been disappointed by their family background. Um, and they had a story about what they were doing differently. Like, so Leah talks about how she had met her husband in college. They're pretty secular and they, they, they were drawn to live, she says, a life of religious seriousness and purpose so that they could build this family that they didn't have. So there's a real sense. I want to do something different. I want to put the family first, but I'm, it's something I, I have confidence I can do because of God and because of the, the resources of the church or in her case, uh, her synagogue. Um, so that's the first, that's the first point. Others, by the way, who had no siblings growing up mm-hmm. and for whom that was a really big motivator. They said like, you know, I thought like, obviously I'd like to give this to my children. Um, the other question you asked, what well, was surprising to you? Is, was if there was something surprising to oh, you. Oh, there were tons of things that were surprising to me. In a sense, the whole book was surprising. Um, and that's so interesting coming from someone who I know. yourself had a kid. So. I have a friend on, on, on X on Twitter who keeps pushing me, like, tell me what was surprising. Didn't you already know this? I said, no, I didn't know this. I mean, I think that sometimes um, sometimes it's, it's, it's incredibly interesting to hear how other people put it, right? Because something that's deep and good, this is a thing that's hard to put into words, right? Which is that... Um, the truth is harder to, to talk about than like, it's hard to describe beauty. Like ugliness is easy. You just, you can point to it, but what makes something beautiful? Well, that's, that's, you know, I'm not a philosopher, but that's a hard thing to describe. The truth is more, more difficult. Fallacies are easy, right? They're easy because they, they're just a, like a, a simplification of something. So things that are noble and beautiful and true and good, like the intrinsic value of children and why you might organize your life around these children. Um, there are many ways to talk about that. And I didn't, most of what I put in that book, I didn't already have at the tip of my tongue. So it was a real gift to me to hear back from people and go, well, yeah, I agree with that. And that's so beautiful. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said that. So, so in a sense, every, everything, maybe m- many things, I'll just note a couple of things. Uh, one was the way in which women of many different faiths, all in a sense with a with a an Abrahamic tradition, um, but women who went to different churches had obviously very different um, scriptures and approaches to reading scripture, um, kept coming back to uh, the same set of themes. That was to me surprising, and I don't know that I expected it. Right. So this language of of um, rejecting a certain kind of planning mentality and that, you know, we've, we haven't talked about that part of this yet, but it's of course, it's connected to a, this assumption that resources are going to be scarce and that there's, you know, people are going to, you know, like this whole, this mechanical idea of how people get born. Then the next thing you say is, well, <clears throat> if people are just going to come into the world in this mechanical way, we now we have to plan it, subject it to human wisdom. So that planned parenthood mentality, population control mentality is just 
that. And so what I really heard across the sample of all women of all these different faiths was a rejection of that kind of, but with very similar language that a rejection of planning. So it wasn't like I'm choosing this number of children in favor of a kind of deference to, to, um, to God's providence. So a kind of openness to children rather than an intentional like consumer mentality, like I'm choosing three or I'm choosing. So in that sense, you know, back to your point earlier, I, I, that was not part of this was I'm choosing X number of children. And so it was the challenge of the book was to try to figure out how to describe openness in a way that didn't sound as if people weren't using their minds or, or making a choice, right? Um, so you're fully, fully participating kind of with God's providence that, that God wanted their yes. He wanted their readiness and he respected their, their need to be ready. So that was so hard to describe, but I, I tried, but it was really surprising to me and I did not expect it. I remember very specific interviews where I went, wow, you know, I'm talking to a Jewish woman in the Northeast and, you know, three weeks later, three weeks ago, I was talking to an LDS lady in, in Salt Lake and you just described this process of knowing when to have your next child in almost the same terms. That's and, amazing. And just to be clear, when you say knowing when to have your next mm -hmm. child, yeah. because we were kind of going back yeah. and forth about this earlier, yeah. which is, you know, babies don't just magically appear. Right. And we're not animals that just copulate because yeah. we can't help ourselves. Yeah. We choose to, you know, make love with our spouse. That yes. is a choice a on choice. any given yeah. week or day. Yeah. And uh, and then also in that sense, we choose to be open to life. And then obviously people who use yeah. birth control can choose not or yeah. not to use it or to use contraception, I, sh I should call it. Yeah. So, uh, when you're when you're talking to these uh, yeah. women and they're saying that they were they felt a sense it was they were ready to mm -hmm. have their next child or it was time. Yep. yep. So 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 yeah. was there planning happening? That's, that's, <laughs> so one lady said planned, not planned, uh, something like that. Um, another said planned by God, but yeah, there was planning. I would like to mm -hmm. say that there was planning, mm -hmm. um, and that's the only that's the only language we have for this. Um, sometimes people will talk about birth spacing, maybe intentionality Intention is a better word. That is the whole idea. Yeah, this is yeah. very intentional. Um, that no baby was sort of an accident. You're like, oh, this was an accident. We, but but is that because it was to. part of a larger project, which yes. is this was the, they went into the project of marriage saying yes. the project of marriage is children are a blessing. Yeah. And so we'll be open to life. And yep. so there's no such thing as an unplanned child. Right. In that project of marriage. Right. Is that a fair way to yeah, put it? Or I would say, no, let's see. I think that's right. I think what you mm -hmm. just said is correct. Um, but I'd want to like maybe expand on a little bit. Um, they all they all really struggled with the use of the word plan because it's really hard to say what, like they all complained about, you know, the surveys, you go into the doctors, it was this child planned or unplanned. You're kind of like, well, it wasn't unplanned, but it wasn't planned exactly. Right. right. This is difficult because you may hope for a child, but it's different. Like you can't snap your right, fingers. You plan like, to drive to the airport. Right. You, you are go right. Exactly. I you plan can, to go buy a dress you can only and I be, go pick it out and I buy that's it. That's right. You can only be open to it. Yeah. Right? Can you do that um, for a child? No, yeah, you can't. That's right. Yeah. So I, I would say that what, what they, they may have used birth control at some point or, or contraception at some point. And we, we talked about that a little bit. Um, almost everybody did at some point in time, whether it was natural methods mm -hmm. to space our children or some of them use IODs to, to have time in between their babies. Um, but the, I think the thought was kind of like the purpose of our marriage. This is why I kind of use this phrase as this like second part. The purpose of our marriage is to welcome children. And sort of all things being equal, we would like another one. But of course, all things are not always equal, right? So just after you give birth, are you open to have a baby at that exact moment? Well, most people weren't open to having a baby at that exact moment. A couple of them were. But most of them described some intentional way of kind of making sure, trying to make sure that they avoided pregnancy for a little while after baby was born, which would seem like that makes sense. How they did it, the logistics of it would be different across the women that I talked to for different reasons. And I tried to put that in there. And so the thought was like that you were, you were kind of, you're, you were living your marriage in a way that was open to God's providence, but that you should discern when you're ready for the next child. So that, you know, if you did have to use contraception to space your children, that would be considered like a cross. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put it like, I think the easiest way to describe it is just to kind of point out how weird that would be. Mm -hmm. Like in the modern, the modern language, you'd think like, you know, I'm, I'm empowered by this at this moment. It would be more like, well, if we can't, cause I'm not healthy right now, 
or we really have to wait till dad's job gets better or we need, you know, something else. It's kind of a sorrow that we can't be, we can't mm. welcome the next child where it's, it's a cross to wait because all things equal, another child is, is pure gift, is pure blessing. Like we were talking before, would make us wealthier in this metaphysical sense. So that was, yeah, that was, that was the challenge was trying to describe what it looks like to say that you've rejected contemporary approaches to planning your family while also saying you're not just mindlessly having children. So, and there's no language for that in our society. I think that language of openness is correct. I think that's, um, but, but because it's so unusual, it's worth spending time describing. Um, so it was, but I'm, I'm really here sitting here telling you that's how I thought about my marriage. And I knew that's how a few friends of mine thought about their marriages, but I did not know if that was common among women of other faiths or women of, you know, less faith or different types of faith. Um, I didn't know if I'd hear that at all. So that was really, really surprising. That was for me very surprising. Of course, that became an organizing theme of the book. It's kind of the big thing you're trying to say. Here's what, here's what makes people different. Um, the other tiny thing or, you know, smaller thing that becomes kind of a, a it's something I included at the very end because it felt, it felt a shame not to include it was this thing that we talked about at the beginning, which was the experience that I had where my first child um, was really a gift of healing to a grieving family. And I thought that was just us and God's providence for us. Um, but in one of the very first interviews, maybe three or four interviews in, we heard a woman tell us about how her husband had been depressed mm. and he'd lost his job and he lost his dad in a kind of real quick succession. And and then they kind of had a, you know, a moderately unexpected pregnancy. Um, and he wasn't excited about it. He he was like, we'll just say bummed about it. He wasn't confident it would be okay. And she says something like, you know, I birthed that baby and I put her in his arms and he never put her down. Mm. And she said, he just held that baby and he healed. Wow. And I was like getting all teary eyed listening to this because I thought, well, I've heard that story before because my grieving children who, the ones who were in their, you know, early teens, like that's, they were too conflicted for me to give them a hug. And I didn't know how I, I didn't have those resources yet. So I put this baby in their arms and they were like, oh, and they, they just needed that love. Like the, what is that? Mm -hmm. And so I heard it from, um, from Kyra. So I tell her story and it was enough. Like if I'd heard it once, I was like, oh, okay, wow. Okay. It was like, all right, give me a minute. I'm not ready to finish this interview yet. And then another interview a few weeks later on the other side of the country, this lady's talking about how their sixth child was completely unexpected and they were happy about it, but it was unexpected. And it was a, a difficult moment they were in because their oldest child had been diagnosed with a very severe anxiety, depression disorder. And they tried all kinds of things, therapists and medications and all these sorts of things. And then this baby was born and she was really struggling in her prayer. Like, why God are you giving us this child now? Because we don't have his symptoms under control. And this seems really overwhelming. And then it was the same story. She said, we brought this baby home and my anxious, depressed, like, I don't know if he was 12 or something. He just held this baby and got better. And I'm like, okay, if I hear this one more time, <laughs> this is going to be a theme, right? No. And I just kept hearing this. Um, many, many times over. So I think it was about, okay, I only interviewed 55 people. It was about 20% of that group, 10, or 10, 11, 12 times. Maybe I heard a specific example of that. And this was surprising. Of course, I didn't expect to hear it, but I was also really, really um, stunned by it. So I thought, well, this is, if this is true, if, if 20% of my little sample, which is not representative of stories like this, like how, how common is this? And is this known? Do people know that babies have the capacity to bring healing to anxious, troubled teenagers or grieving adult men? And I thought, well, wait a minute, like we're, we're really busy telling people that if they have a baby at a difficult time, they should definitely run out and abort that baby. And I thought like, maybe we should like ask more questions about this, you know? So the way I put it in the book, like this is a pretty awkward question to ask for a nation that's been busy aborting its babies. And now we have this mountain of like teenage anxiety disorder, like 
other people are researching this and, you know, I'm sure smartphones are part of the problem and like on being online is part of the problem. And there's many things that are part of the problem, but our teenagers aren't living with babies. Our teenagers are not living with babies. They're not living with babies. Because they're one or two of because them. Because they're one or two. There's not a big enough family for the parents to still be having kids. Correct. And there's a baby in there. Correct. House. And nobody thinks about that. Wow. And I was what like, a point, Catherine. I know, right? I, so this was, this like knocked me, knocked me off my feet. And, and you're referring is, to the decline in yeah. mental health for teens today. Teens in particular. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, right? Combined with the decline in birth rate. Right. It's like, boom. They don't have siblings. They don't have siblings. Little siblings. They don't have little siblings. And so many of the women talked about how... That's such a powerful point. I know. I mean, I think about my life and I had right. mental health issues as a teen. Yeah. In part because of the use of media. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it was like yeah. the early sure. Tumblr, like MySpace. Uh, oh, yeah. MySpace. It was the blog. But yeah. anyways, like, you know, eating disorder stuff. Mm -hmm. I had issues and there's other yeah. things in the family. I, I wrote about it in my book. But yeah. I, w one thing I mentioned in the book was having this cause was yeah. very helpful to me. But connected to that cause was the little children in my home, which were mm -hmm. part of the cause, like part the baby the yep. and how beautiful is the baby and the, and the whole yep. thing of the baby. And yeah, I mean, babies are so healing. They are. They're so healing and they're so orienting. It's yeah. like, what's life about? You hear the cry yeah. and it's like, this is life's about this. And it's so beautiful. And I was, I was um, feeding my daughter yesterday and I was just marveling at how happy I felt I was just like, I know. I'm it's so like, happy. Like, not that it's easy, not that no, they're, and again, I, there's everyone's story is yeah. different, but yeah, so much, I mean, there's physical oxytocin, you know, flowing through my yeah. veins right mm -hmm. now, yeah. holding this little mm -hmm. one and that's God's design. And yeah. it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. For me, this was, um, I put this, I put this in a chapter called saving our lives and I heard it so many times. I thought, this has to be like the next book. I mean, this has to be like a topic. I mean, there should be whole teams of researchers out trying to figure this out. Um, it's, I don't know anybody who talks about this. So to me, that was like, for sure, it was up there. It was like big, big. So this wasn't the reason for my, you know, my study. I was after kind of why would people have kids and stuff. But for some small group of the people that I talked to, like Kyra, the reason she went on to have more children after that is because her husband then said, babies are never the problem. Wow. It's okay. We can, the problem. Yeah, we can have another baby. Um, and so for, for a sub, some group of them, that was why they went on to have more children. They had seen like, why would we, why would we, why would we stop this? Like, why would we say no to the next child? So, um, yeah, so I there's probably more we could say and theorize about that. I think what it means for a teenager who's got all kinds of anxiety or just, you know, insecurities. My, I've got teenage sons that are one of whom thinks he should weigh more and be more physically fit, you know, more buff. He's sort of trying to build up his little scrawny muscles, you know, but the point is he's, he lacks confidence mm -hmm. and he's in the process of becoming a man, but his younger brother who's eight, you know, really thinks he's a, he's a big man, you know? And I think that's gotta, that's gotta count for something. He thinks his older brother's mm -hmm. a big man. Yeah. big yeah, man. Cause he is. He's him. a big man. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, he, he's, you know, kind of Such a hero. a good point. Yeah. So I'd like to research this more, uh, but I really like to get that message out to more. Um, I would be willing to bet that if we, if we work to find more of those stories, that those stories need to be told. Thank you for yeah. telling these stories that need to be told. Um, where can people find Hannah's children? Well, they can find it on <laughs> Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage people who aren't readers or who find the size of that book a little intimidating. The audible version is also, of course, on Amazon and is um, right and easy to listen to. And I didn't ask you this at the mm -hmm. beginning, but this is the last question I mm -hmm. promise because I gotta mm -hmm. let you go. I know. Yeah. Who's Hannah? Oh, who Hannah? Hannah is the she's the it's all the women in the book have um pseudonyms, but Hannah's the name I gave to the first woman you meet in the book, um, who I never thought she would have children and had this uh, amazing religious conversion and then went on to get married and have seven children. And she's really funny and you wanna read about her story. It's really great. Um, but Hannah, of course, is also the biblical Hannah who was barren and prayed for children and God said, God sent her Samuel. We know about Samuel for this child I prayed. Mm -hmm. um, but what I didn't know until I went back and studied the story of Hannah and Hannah's na the name Hannah means blessed by God with a child. And when I went back and reread the story of Hannah in preparation for writing this book, and I was working on it. I was stunned to find out that when she brings Samuel back to God. So she prays for the baby. She says, God, I, if you give me this baby, I'll bring him back to you to live in your service. And so she brings her beloved Samuel back to the temple and the priests say, that is so much faith. 
like that. What a great gift. She's brought her most valuable possession. And the priest says to God, we should reward this woman for her faith. And she has five more children. So those are Hannah's children. So really this idea of being blessed and, um, which really was the the resounding message. So I wanted to invoke the biblical Hannah and also just to make it, to say it out loud, um, that, um, although I studied women with many children, nobody's better because they have more because these are blessings, right? So this is not something that makes us better or more meritorious. And so, um, as you might imagine, my publisher wanted to kind of title this book with something a little bit more, you know, have more children sort of thing, or be, you know, choose more, a worse title of super moms. And I thought, no, 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 actually, this is a story of women who feel very humbled and very, mm. um, not worthy to receive their blessings. And so, uh, this is not a story of, of being better by having more, but by being, um, I would say, yeah, humbled by the, by the presence mm. of the almighty and the way that he works miracles in our lives. And so I think that in the person of Hannah, we can find both the, the barren woman who couldn't have children and the woman who's sort of blessed mm. beyond measure in this single person, mm. which, which I think hopefully we can find, you know, all of us mm. who blessed with few or many, whatever our state in lives that we can find in, in that scriptural person of Hannah, um, a kind of, a kind of solidarity, uh, because we're, what we're, we're united by is this like sense of the presence of the almighty in our lives. So mm. I, I really wanted to strive to find a way to talk about this in a way that wouldn't make any woman feel less, but we could celebrate the, the gift of God's, God's blessings in our lives. You did it beautifully. Thank, thank you thank so you. much, Catherine. Thanks You're for welcome. joining the podcast. Absolutely. It was so much fun. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.